are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is a solved one asking how did a teenage couple turn into killer cadets? Now, this is a case that shows you that sometimes that people who appear to have their life together and their future planned out are more dangerous than anyone else because that future is something that they will do anything to get to no matter how bad it truly is. By the way, I post so much content like this. It's my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean no harm or disrespect when I do so. And if it's something you would like to support me in doing, all you have to do is make sure you are subscribed with the post notification bell on, give this video a thumbs up, and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1995 in Texas and the Jones family lived in a place called Mansfield. Now this was Linda and Bill and they had three children, one of which was a 16-year-old girl named Adrian Jessica Jones, who often went by AJ by her friends and family. Of course, at this point, she was about a sophomore in high school and she was actually such a beautiful and mature girl, but that wasn't all that she was. She was extremely smart as well she was an honor student and she participated in extracurricular activities as well including sports like cross country and this isn't actually what she had trained in all of her life she had been in soccer but when she hurt her knee she couldn't continue participating so she went on to cross country and she quickly picked it up and in fact led her team to regionals for the two mile run now so many said that she had so much respect and joy in her school and representing them and representing the teams and making everyone look good and that many believe she actually should have been a cheerleader because she was so good at just ramping up everybody's school spirit. Now, if that didn't seem like a lot for a 16 year old to be doing, Adrian also went to work at the Golden Fried Chicken, which is of course like a fast food restaurant. And she loved it there, but more importantly, her staff loved her working there and her boss really enjoyed having her as an employee, which is so important to have both sides of it. And she would work about 20 hours a week on top of everything else she was doing. And in fact, she was a prize employee, within weeks of her working there because they would put her at the drive through because she was so good with customers. She had a bubbly personality. She drew a smiley face on her visor so everybody could see it. And she would also make little jokes with them as they drove past. And in fact, one of the things she loved to say was drive forward to the 99th window to pick up your food. And it was just something that she loved to do was seeing a smile on other people's faces. And she did it so naturally and never felt like it was something she rehearsed. She was a goofy girl who made an impact even in the mundane and this meant she also had a ton of friends and a ton of interest from boys and being a teenager herself she loved that attention you know she was completely okay with the opposite sex with her being a straight female kind of wanting to know her a bit more and flirting with her and she was said to be a flirt back to them and in fact every time she left the house she made sure that she looked okay because she always told her family you know I never know who I'm gonna meet when I go out so I always want to look in the greatest form that I can. But the amazing thing about her was that she didn't prioritize boys over anything else. She was purely academic sports work her future. However, she did know how to have fun as well. She actually wanted to attend the Texas A&M University after she graduated and become a behavioral analyst. Her father was a large bearded man who was awfully strict on his daughter because he knew that although he raised her well, he couldn't be certain that all these teenagers she was hanging out with were raised the same way. So he did install a a pretty strict curfew of 9 p.m. and that had just recently been pushed back. It used to be earlier than that but at this time she was coming home at 9 p.m. and if she went anywhere like a movie or anything like that she would need to bring home the ticket stub so she could confirm that that is where she had actually been and in fact when she started getting a little bit older she started to sneak out at night out of her window to go and meet with friends and boys and when her dad heard about this he actually nailed her window 
window shut, telling her that would no longer be happening. She was the typical teen, a kind and well-spoken girl with a bright future ahead of her. However, that would all change on December 3rd and nobody would understand why. You see, that very early morning, a farmer would be going down to his mailbox. Of course, farmers rise really early and he would be headed down there when he would see a horrific scene. The body was behind a barbed wire fence and upon first look, it didn't even appear to be human. When this farmer got closer, he immediately headed home to call the police. And when investigators got there, they found that this was a female with a gunshot wound to her forehead and her left cheek. And the left side of her head was actually crushed and her skull was caved in from the aggressiveness of whatever had struck her. There was blunt force trauma to her head. Unfortunately, there had been no girls reported missing in the area at this time and she, the body was so unrecognizable that they really couldn't tell who it was upon first glance, even if one of them would have known who it was. This female was wearing gray shorts and a gray t-shirt that said UIL Region 1 Cross Country Regionals 1995 and this is actually a huge clue that would help in the identification of this Jane Doe because it would lead them to a high school 25 minutes away in Mansfield and to a girl named Adrienne. Her parents, Bill and Linda, had woke up that morning and had realized that she was not in her bedroom, but her mother knew that because she ran cross country, she often liked to get up early in the mornings to run. So she figured that is just where her daughter was and left it at that. It was getting a little while later in the day and her mother was getting concerned that she still wasn't back. And that is when she would find Adrian's running shoes, meaning there's no way she would have gone running without them. So that is when they decided to call the police and get them involved. And unfortunately, it would be pretty soon after that they would realize that their daughter had already been found. And the Jones family had woken up that morning in peace with happiness in their hearts, knowing that they had a beautiful family that they could love and cherish. And that was all being ripped apart within seconds. Investigators immediately theorized that Adrian had known her killer because there was a lack of struggle anywhere at the crime scene or anywhere on her body. There was no sign of any bindings on her wrists, on her feet. It appeared as though she had gone with this person willingly at first and knew them. They didn't need to restrain her to get her where they needed her to be. And it also appeared that this was done almost execution style. And this is when investigators would go to her home to see if they could find any further clues there. And they found no more signs of a struggle there. Nobody appeared to have broken into her bedroom or the house at all. And everything seemed normal. And her parents said that's how they found it that morning when they woke up. They didn't clean up anything. So investigators believe that clearly this was a person who was really good at being deceptive because they said it takes a cold-blooded person to shoot a pretty young girl in the face from two to four feet away. The question was, who was this killer who had two faces? If they didn't show this side of themselves to anyone else, how are they ever going to catch this person? And there was also another problem with the fact that Adrian was such a bubbly, friendly girl. She had so many acquaintances from friends to coworkers to teammates to boys that she liked that could have possibly done this and they would have to go through every single one of them to find out if they had a connection. And this wasn't the main priority in the media to share Adrian's case. Because there was already a case in Arlington, Texas that had everybody enveloped in the search. And this was of Amber Hagerman, which we have covered on my channel before, but if you don't know, she is the missing child who created or helped to create the Amber Alert, which is, you know, of course, put out for everyone when a child is known to be kidnapped. And it's something that really helps a lot but back then that didn't exist and when amber disappeared it is the reason for it being created and 
Amber's case was so big in the media at the time that Adrian's kind of fell to the wayside. To her family and friends, of course, this was devastating. They wanted answers and they seemed to not be getting any investigators, couldn't find any clues. The community was doing their best to overcome the shock of it all. In fact, they all wore ribbons that they made for Adrian and they also created a memorial of sorts with sticks and some electrical wire to make a cross at her crime scene and they also created a room in her school where different counselors were so the kids who knew her and had heard what had happened as everybody did could go and talk if they were struggling with any of it if they knew her personally or just if it was a lot for them to handle they could go and talk to somebody about it which I think is wonderful. Everyone kind of found their different ways to distract themselves from the pain. Unfortunately that came at the cost of a Adrian's reputation because that is when the rumors began to spread because people wanted to figure out, especially her classmates, why this happened and who it was. Her friends began to fear it was someone that they actually walked the hallways with, that it was someone in high school that they knew that had possibly, you know, told Adrian a secret that they couldn't have released and that maybe Adrian had told them this secret and that they would be next if they told it and they hadn't even known that that is why Adrian was killed. And along with this, other people who weren't Adrian's friends began to say it was probably the fact that Adrian went to raves all the time and stayed up all night and met with drug dealers and that that is how she was murdered. It was by one of these drug dealers for money or that it was by one of the many boys that she had slept with because apparently people were saying that there was so many. Although her mother started hearing all these rumors and said, that's not my daughter. She may be a teenager and there may be some subtle things that I don't know, but that is not Adrian. And she even told a reporter, my daughter isn't asleep around. And so these theories were really running rampant. And in fact, her father said the only theory that wasn't presented was the fact that she was abducted by aliens, which kind of tells you how bad it was really getting, especially for her family and friends who knew her as one thing and her being portrayed after being murdered as something else would be just another thing on top of what they were already going through. While investigators worked on the case, her funeral was held at the Methodist Church at first just for her family and then they held another one for, you know, all of the classmates and her mother really wanted the classmates who were of course still in high school still young to be able to kind of process it better and to not go into such a horrific you know funeral and to to hear all that negativity that they were already hearing and in fact she tried to bring some positivity and light and she even said at one point joking around do you remember the way she walked with that bubble butt of hers she just tried to make light of the whole situation and i'm sure that was hard to do through her pain but she wanted them to remember adrian as who she was that bubbly personality and you can really tell from that that adrian got her personality from her mother and it's a kind of beautiful way that her mother kind of gave a tribute to her daughter and tried to make it as happy as possible. Back at home, as you expect, her family was falling apart from grief and, you know, they kept her bedroom light on all the time for months. And her mother also wore something of Adrian's every single day, whether that was makeup, clothing, jewelry, whatever, to feel closer to her. And for months, this investigation was going on and they still had no idea what happened to their daughter. Since investigators believed that it was someone Adrian knew, they began to look into high schoolers. They were going on stakeouts at different schools in the area and they were also talking to staff about the children and asking if there was anyone who got in trouble a lot or just seemed, you know, out of the ordinary sometimes and had, you know, different kinds of aggression or hatred that showed in school and they also talked to Adrian's friends about anyone who could possibly hate her or have a grudge against her trying to get a list of people and that is what they got so they went in deep and they decided to talk to a whole bunch of students and just basically follow around these children for a really long time to see if they could find anything out of the ordinary. Problem was, if Adrian was fooled by this deceptive killer, the chances were a lot of people at these schools were as well. 
and so it would make it hard for anybody to really know how this person acted if they didn't act the same in school as they did the night she was killed. But with this being the only lead, investigators went full in. Investigators also wanted to retrace her footsteps from the night before and that is when they found something interesting because December 3rd her parents would say that that night she was on the phone at about 10 30 p.m to a boy who was her boyfriend and it was said that her friends didn't say anything about this boyfriend because she just started dating him and they didn't really think about it his name was tracy smith they had met at a prior job they went to different high schools so not a lot of people she knew actually knew him but they were talking that night on the phone and the thing was adrian was actually supposed to be off the phone by 10 p.m but tracy was actually out of town with his parents and had called late and adrian had asked her mother and father if she could still talk to him for a while and they said for a few minutes she could but this isn't actually what caught the attention of the investigators the most because her mother would say she would pass by adrian's room while she was on the phone and just to make sure you know she wasn't doing anything inappropriate or anything like that and and her mother would then hear her telling Tracy, hang on, there's someone on the other line. And she would click off and get on this other line with this other person. And her mother said that that is when her demeanor kind of changed from bubbly and happy with her boyfriend to very quiet and serious. They talked for a couple of minutes and then Adrienne went back to talking to Tracy, her boyfriend. And that is when her mother walked in and said, who was that that you were talking to? And Adrian said, oh, it's just a boy named David from cross country. He was just upset about something. And so her mother kind of left it at that, let her finish talking to her boyfriend. By 1045, her mother would walk back by, she would be off the phone, but Adrian would also be ironing clothes at this point. And her mother said she appeared to be very antsy or on edge at this point and she basically told her you need to go to bed it's late so she did so however you know this is something that would not cause much concern for a teenage parent because that's kind of how they are at some points you know the moods go up and down hormones are everywhere but in this instance it did cause for concern and it definitely caught the investigators attention that she was acting this way after this strange phone call and that is when her brother would say that he had heard a sound around midnight or a little after that sounded like an old pickup truck. Her mother said that that next morning when they found out that she was in fact missing, her mother called the cross country coach to get in contact with this David boy that Adrian had been on the phone with prior that night because she also called Tracy and Tracy didn't know where Adrian was. So the cross country coach got in contact with this boy on the team named David. There was in fact one and he talked to David about if he talked to her the night prior, if he knew where he was and David said, no, why would I talk to her? They weren't close at all. Hearing this, investigators actually went to talk to Tracy themselves about, you know, if he knew anything more. And that's when Tracy would actually tell them that you know, she had told her mother she was talking to a boy named David, but she had actually told him that she was talking to a boy named Brian who had emotional problems and she was helping him through it. Adrian had told Tracy that he sometimes just called to talk and that he was depressed and actually wanted to meet her that night. And that is when investigators found this Brian who attended her school and found that he was struggling with mental health issues and taking four kinds of different medication to help with that. Now they brought him in to be questioned and Brian said that he actually couldn't remember if he was with Adrian that night or not because for the first time in six months he had gotten drunk. And investigators said, well, why did you drink then after six months? And he said that he was feeling low because all of his friends had girlfriends and he didn't. His full name was Brian McMillan and he was 17 years old and working at Subway. And he had once worked at Subway with Adrian. And her mother, upon hearing this name Brian that worked at Subway, a memory registered in her mind. And she said, actually, this is probably the same Brian that Adrian would talk about a lot of times as someone who kind of made her feel uncomfortable because they worked together and they were friendly, they got along. But then Brian started coming into the restaurant when he didn't have a shift just to see Adrian and it was so often 
that she felt uncomfortable and she started ducking under the counter so he couldn't see her. A week later, he was arrested in his home and his pickup truck was brought in to be searched. Now, he would continue to say that he didn't know if he did anything. His friends and family said that they were confused he would even be thought of as a suspect because he was so not the type of violent person that they were looking for. And his dad said he was home that night and he never left. However, investigators kept him in jail over the Christmas season and to New Year's and that is when they finally gave him a polygraph test which he passed with flying colors at that point they didn't have anything else to hold him on so they released him and investigators had also talked to this david you know in case that was the real person she was talking to not this brian and so they talked to david but they found nothing incriminating against him and in fact they didn't find any connection from David to Adrian because he wasn't even in her phone book or her messages. By this point, however, they already had a different suspect and this suspect was female. She lived in the same town. She was from a trailer park and a year prior to this murder had gotten a restraining order from her boyfriend because she had shot him. But they were looking at her in Adrian's case because she not only shot her boyfriend, but this girl had severely beaten up a girl who had slept with her boyfriend. This girl had been hit over the head with a baseball bat and had a broken cheekbone as well as a concussion. And come to find out, this girl who was severely beaten was actually one of Adrian's friends. And when they had to go to court, Adrian actually went to testify on behalf of her friend and this girl who had beaten her friend allegedly came up to her and said, I'll get you for this. Many of Adrian's friends believed that this girl had killed her. However, she was brought in for a polygraph test as well and she passed. And that is when Adrian's family began to say they believed that her boyfriend, Tracy, possibly had something to do with it because he hadn't contacted them since she had been killed and found, and they thought it was really weird. He was brought in and passed a polygraph test as well. I mean, there were four suspects and still no evidence against any of them and no sign that this case was going to be closed anytime soon, even though it was a year since she had been found. Her father began to want to interrogate every teenager that he saw and her mother also drove to the crime scene in the middle of the night all the time hoping that she would come across the killer. Then in 1996, a confession of sorts would occur. This had come from a Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and that is when two female cadets would go to the authorities saying that they had a horrific statement to tell, one that involved a murder that happened in Texas that their roommate, Diane Zamora, told her roommates that her boyfriend would never cheat on her because they had something connecting them, a murder. Now, of course, investigators immediately flew to Maryland and they pulled her out of a pep assembly she was at and they began to interrogate her. And that's when Diane said, no, I was, I was kidding. I was just trying to seem tough to my roommates. And with nothing else to hold her on, they released her. However, the Naval Academy did suspend her for lying. But investigators weren't just going to leave it there. In fact, they decided to fly to Colorado to question a man. And this was Diane's boyfriend who was in the Air Force Academy. And they would bring him in and they would want to know if he had anything to do with a murder. And he would say that he had no idea why his girlfriend would say this, that they didn't have anything to do with a murder. But they didn't believe this, and for 30 hours, they questioned him. His name? David. David Graham. That's right. The David that she had said she was on the phone with that night to her mother. The one she was on the cross-country team with. But Adrian had told Tracy it was actually a boy named Brian, so which one was the truth? Well, to tell you that, we're going to have to dig a little bit further into Diane and David's past. Diane was born in 1978 to an electrician and a sales worker, and her grandfather was actually a minister, so they were very religious, went to church all the time, and Diane was also a very good student. She would study all the time. She would wake up hours earlier to study. She would work hard, and she was just known to be an overachiever. When she wasn't studying or going to school, she would be watching her younger siblings while her parents were at work. Now, by the time of 
2013, she actually enrolled in the Civil Air Patrol in hopes of joining the Air Force when she got older. So she kind of had her life already, you know, mapped out and she was ready for her future. Then her family life would turn upside down when her father would cheat on her mother with a woman that they all went to church with. And Diane had actually found her father cheating and refused to have contact with him at all after this and her father actually left the family for this woman and making them go bankrupt and they lost their house and they were actually homeless for quite a while. Diane kind of became the person that her mother would vent to about certain things, especially about her ex-relationship and her mother even brought her to her ex-husband and this new woman's home to confront them and to even ransack their home and steal things from their car. But Diane was still focusing on her schoolwork through all of this. She had planned to be an astronaut and she was still the top of her class. David had grown up with three siblings as well and his family also went to church often. Now, his mother actually left them by leaving a note on the table which David found and this is just, you know, one of the thing that paralleled in Diane and David's lives greatly and their parents were both strict. They were still really wonderful students and David actually planned to be a pilot and he was said to be a really awkward but kind human. People at David's school actually called him Colonel Graham because they were said to have a lot of respect for the fact that he already knew what he wanted to do and he always kind of dressed like he was in the service and ready and he always had the military haircut on him. And the girls at his school actually said he was one of the last few cool guys on earth and he was pretty good looking as well. Now, Diane and David had actually crossed paths at 13 years old because David had also joined the Civil Air Force or the Civil Air Patrol. And he actually went on to learn to fly a plane a year later. But they didn't necessarily get along at this point. In fact, Diane called him a pig and thought that he was basically disgusting and she hated how he would tell her the things that she was doing wrong and kind of call her out on different things and she wanted nothing to do with him. Four years later, they were going to different high schools and that is when they began to date. And this was Diane going to Crowley High School and David going to Mansfield High School. But they decided that they were going to make it work that they had a sort of relationship that was pure and that was much more mature than the typical teenage relationship. In fact, a month later, they would be engaged to be married. They refused to be divorced or separated like their parents and they clung on to each other for dear life. Although that didn't mean they didn't fight and that was physically as well. David would stab Diane in the knee at one point. Diane would slap David several times. Um, they would also kick and bite and choke each other and not in a playful way. They were in quite a toxic relationship from the beginning and Diane would not sleep with David until they were married. So this is why they were thought to be engaged so quickly and so young. Her family was so religious and once they heard that she was sleeping with David now that she was engaged, they said that it was fine as long as she knew he was the one and she said she believed he was. She said if she could not be Miss David Graham, she would die as Miss Diane Zamora. And before David, she had said she couldn't believe how stupid her two cousins were who got pregnant in high school and that that would never happen to her. She wanted nothing to do with boys before she had started dating David. In fact, she would basically tell anyone who wanted to go on a date that she had to study. And in fact, she had a boyfriend for a few months before David and she dumped him because he wanted to sleep with her. They were both in their senior year at high school at this point and David was kind of known at his school as the guy Guy that everybody knew but no one was really friends with and he was also on the cross-country team where he would be going to regionals because both the boys and the girls had qualified and they would be going together. That's when David and Adrian would meet. They would spend time together at this meet and then they would sit together on the bus ride home. Now, Allegedly, this is when David gave Adrian a ride home in his car, but that isn't exactly all that happened and they actually stopped to have sex 
behind a school. Now, this is one theory as to what happened. However, many of Adrian's friends said that this could not be true because Adrian was not the type to do that to someone who had a girlfriend. David then allegedly went to see his girlfriend knowing he had just cheated on her and brought her a stuffed animal and appeared very scared. Diane was said to be one who kept to herself in school as well and she in fact didn't want to really hang out with anyone. She really kept to herself and studied and occasionally she would hang out with her peers if they were like homework buddies but none of them were really friends. People said she was sweet but naive and almost lived kind of a sheltered life and at one point she had actually gotten in an accident when she was driving David's pickup truck and she had to go to the hospital and David had come and stayed right by her side the whole time but he was the only one to visit her. She called him tiger, he called her kittens and they would always say at the end of a conversation greenish brown female sheep which basically means I love you because greenish brown is olive or it's the color of olive which can sound like I love and then you is a female sheep and so together it said I love you. However, when David came to her house that day with his stuffed animal, she did not know yet what he had done. But is this the reason for the murder of Adrian? Did this spell out a motive? Well, a friend of David's had a secret that he had been keeping and that was that the night of the murder, he had seen both David and Diane because they had come to his window and come through to his home in bloodied clothing. Before he could ask any questions, David asked him or begged him not to ask any questions, and so he didn't. And the couple laid on the floor and prayed together before getting up and going home. After this, David and Diane became even more obsessed with each other. They couldn't leave each other's side. In fact, they were always together. And one day when they weren't, when Diane's family said she couldn't see him for the night, she started sobbing and begged her mother to call David to make sure that he hadn't gotten hurt. Every time Diane was at school functions and out of the house, David would call her home every single hour to see if she was home. It was a kind of dependency that was terrifying in the eyes of Diane's family. They weren't oblivious to this at all. They could see it and they didn't know how bad it had really gotten. Then came the end of high school when David was accepted into the Air Force and Diane to the Navy, so they would be going in separate directions. However, they said that that would not separate them. And in fact, at graduation, David had gotten a standing ovation for getting into the Air Force with Diane by his side because people were so proud that he had stuck with it and that he was such an outstanding student and citizen. They were determined to get married in about five years and they would have to do their training first. So they both went their separate ways saying that they were going to talk all the time through email or on the phone and that is what they would do. And Diane's, you know, leaders and her squad leader especially would say that she was emotionally distant often. She would always talk about David, how much she missed him and really just wasn't all the way in it. It seemed as though to the squad leader that she wanted to be with David, but she also didn't trust him and she would also have crying fits if he didn't answer her emails. She then started to think that David was having an affair and so she had told her squad leader that she was going to basically tell him that she was having an affair with him. And that he kissed her. Now, I'm not sure if that's even true, if he kissed her or not. That's when David wrote to her saying to stop, please stop deceiving him and stop making up all these lies. And he also wrote to the squad leader threatening him if he didn't get away from Diane. David then told Diane to remember what binds them together. Now, at this point, the squad leader, whose name was Jay, had been asking Diane as they spent more and more time together. It did seem like they were having an affair by this point. He began to ask her, has your boyfriend ever cheated on you? And she said, yes. He asked her what she did about this. And Diane point blank said, I asked her to kill the other girl. She said her name was Adrian and I watched him do it. And Jay had no idea if she was kidding or not and no idea what he should do. They had legal obligations to tell when, you know, something like this occurred with, with one of the cadets, but 
He also really liked Diane. But now they were interrogating David because they couldn't get anything out of Diane and David would also be denying everything, but then they would tell him that they talked to his friend and they knew everything. That he had seen the bloody clothes, that they knew that they had killed Adrian. And that is when David sat down at a typewriter and began to confess in a four-page letter. He said he had called Adrian that night and said that he wanted to meet with her, and so he drove in Diane's parents' Mazda with Diane hiding in the back, and he picked her up, and that is when they would drive to a secluded road, and Adrian was feeling very comfortable. She kind of leaned back in her chair because she had no idea who she was in the car with who they really were. That's when David said Diane popped up from the back and hit Adrian over the head with a dumbbell, and this didn't kill her. In fact, it made her dizzy, disoriented, but she got out of the car and she began to run. Unfortunately, because she was so disoriented and dizzy, she ran as long as she could and then fell into a field, and that is when Diane and David caught up to her and decided to shoot her. And David shot her two times before running back to the car and driving away. And that is when they would both say, I love you. And Diane would say, we shouldn't have done that. David said that the only thing that could satisfy Diane's womanly vengeance was the life of the one who had for one instant taken her place. Now, David also said that right before this, he had finally told Diane what he had done, that he had cheated on her, and she began to have a hysterical fit. She was screaming, she was crying, she was throwing herself against the floor, against walls, trying to hurt herself. She was trying to crack her skull as well, and she was saying she didn't want to live anymore, and that's when she started to scream, kill her, kill her, kill her, over and over, until David agreed. Now that they had his confession, they went to arrest Diane on September 6th of 1996, and she would finally confess as well. She was put into a solitary cell um, a floor away from David, and throughout this whole time, she would do workouts in her cell every day. She wouldn't talk to the guards or the other prisoners when she got out, and everyone around her said she seemed like such an innocent, sweet girl. They couldn't believe that she had done this. Investigators then searched David's home where they found a gun matching the murder weapon as well as dumbbells. And they also still continued to talk to David and Diane to see if they could get any more information. That's when they found that their original plan was to strangle Adrian and then tie weights to her body and throw her in the lake. Diane said that she had popped up and asked Adrian if she had sex with her boyfriend and Adrian said yes, but she did feel guilty about it and that is when the attack occurred and Diane said basically the exact same thing that David did. She said that they disposed of their bloody clothes, they drove home and that's when they saw that there was blood in the car so she cleaned it up while David went and puked. It was found on Diane's calendar on December 4th. It said, Adrian, 1.38 a.m. However, then both would recant their statements and David would say that he did not kill Adrian, that he only helped Diane cover it up. And Diane would say the exact opposite, blaming David. That is when it was also found that the whole reason that was thought to be motive for this murder was false. That Adrian and David never actually had sex. It did not happen. David had created it all to make Diane jealous when he told her and that Adrian actually got a car ride home from a completely different cross-country member that night. When the news broke that two teenagers had been arrested in this murder that had been from the high school that, you know, everybody knew, you could just feel the tense energy in the air of the community. It was of horror, it was of despair, and several tragedies would actually occur after this, and that would be a junior in high school being shot in the face and killed, and another girl on the cross-country team took her own life, and her parents, Adrian's parents, actually had to change their phone numbers because so many people were calling them. The trial began in February of 1998, three years after this had happened, and her mother had actually asked that the death penalty be taken off the table because she didn't want to see more young people die, but she did want them to be punished. But the question during this trial was, did Diane cause this? Or did she watch it happen innocently? Or did they do it completely equally and had one shot 
for each of them. Well, Zanya was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with the minimum of 40 years, and the same went for David. Now, this case is said to be a modern-day Romeo and Juliet, except for they killed someone else instead of themselves. David was asked by a reporter what he would say to Diane, and he said, I love you. And Diane asked a guard to tell David something, and the guard said, what is it? And she said, greenish brown, female sheep. David actually began to work to be a pastor while inside jail, and he would also come to realize that he would have done everything differently if he could have, and he also would have pleaded guilty. That Diane was the motivator, but he went through with it, and that's all that matters. He was no longer in contact with Diane years later, and Diane was actually in contact with a different man named Stephen Mora. He was also an inmate, and he was convicted for auto theft, burglary, and threatening someone, but they got married behind bars and divorced five years later. David had also gotten married while behind bars and was earning a degree in criminology and he said about their guilt that he wasn't going to tell any of the people who loved Adrian that they didn't deserve life in prison. So he had kind of accepted it. However, Diane had not. In 2007, Diane would be interviewed by Dateline, and this is when she would say that her and David were breaking up at this time, and that David had used the murder to tie her to him. She took a polygraph test, however, the person giving it to her had to tell her to stop taking exaggerated breaths, because this is sometimes a technique used to fail the test or make it inconclusive, and she said, oh, I wasn't doing it on purpose, I was just really nervous. However, she had been given the questions to this test beforehand to look over it. She said she wasn't a killer or a witch or an evil-hearted person, but Adrian wouldn't have been in that situation if she didn't lose her temper. Crime Watch Daily also interviewed Diane a little while later, and she said she'd never had any physical part in the murder and that she never asked David to murder her either, that she had only wished that Adrian was dead. She said she believed David did it because he was obsessed with guns and he wanted to see how it would feel to shoot someone and that basically she was someone that he could blame. She was simply a good excuse and that was when Crime Watch Daily would bring in a man who was known as a human lie detector because he really analyzes the behavior and, you know, the way people say things to detect if they're being truthful or not. What he saw was that when Diane was talking about it and saying she didn't have a physical part in it, she didn't talk about the part she did have and how much of an impact that would have made. He also saw her using some of the same hand movements and actions that she had in court, like the exact same things as though it was rehearsed. Ultimately, he found that Diane was being elusive, not deceptive, which is harder to see when you are talking to somebody. What part do you believe that Diane had in all of this? I mean, it's hard to know and it's a question that we ask often in couple killers or killer couple cases, you know, if the female has something to do with it or, you know, is the motivator for it. You know, it's quite interesting the dynamics between a couple and how we really don't know in a lot of these killer couple cases who it is, why it happened. This case is, however, one that I believed wouldn't have ever have happened if Diane and David had never met. However, would each of them had gone on to become criminals if they hadn't met? If this never happened? It's a question to ponder because I often wonder if that nature was in them all along or if they brought it out in one another. I'd love to hear your theories on this one and I hope you are all doing well, staying inside. Do not go out for anything other than essential. I am with you. I am sending you all my love and we can all get through this together. Just try to stay as positive as possible. All right? Don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.